The OCD Stories is sponsored by NoCD. NoCD are dedicated to creating a better everyday life for people with OCD by making care more accessible, more connected and more effective. NoCD deliver exposure and response prevention sessions with an OCD trained therapist directly inside the NoCD platform done over face-to-face video conferencing. In the US, NoCD now accept insurance from insurance companies including Cigna, United Healthcare, Regents, Primera Blue Cross, and Blue Cross Blue Shield, among many others. NoCD can also help out with out-of-network reimbursement if they currently don't take your insurance. If you want to find out more, call NoCD's intake team to find out if they currently take your insurance in your state. You can do this by going to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or by clicking the link in the episode description. Now on to the episode. Hey guys and welcome to episode 227 of the OCDstories.com podcast. And this episode I got on Sam Jones. Sam has kindly agreed to share his story with us and we're going into lots of detail on how OCD has impacted his life and what he's been doing to uh, get better from it. So I originally met Sam a couple years ago at a Made a Millions event here in the UK, so it's great to finally get him on the podcast to share his story with you. So without further ado, here he is. On the podcast today, I have Sam Jones, who has kindly agreed to share his story with us. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you, Stuart. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Um, and of course, I met you at an OCD event, geez, what was it, like two years ago, maybe? Uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, about, about 18 months. About 18 the months. Made a Millions uh, launch, yeah. Yeah, in London, yeah. So it was... It was Good to good to meet you there and hear some of your story. So we're looking forward to hearing more of it now. Um, so as you know, as, as much detail or as little you want to give, it'd be great to hear your OCD story. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, it all began for me, I think, looking back on it. I think was sort of there were some first initial signs that might not have been OCD straight away, but maybe when... I go back to when I was about seven years old, I had, there was probably about a three month period just as I got into junior school and it was this big change um, at the time for a seven year old. And um, I I think I had that realization of, um, oh, you don't live forever. Just because I I remember being in primary school at the table and this kid opposite me said, you know, you could die today. And (laughs) it didn't land very well with me. and uh, I got very worried about catching like an illness. Mm. And I think um, looking back on it now, I realized I, I was going through um, emetophobia. That was that kind of those uh, that that's what evolved out of it. And it got to the point that I actually ended up spending a night in hospital mm. because I was so convinced I was having like appendicitis or or something like that. Um, yeah. But once I'd had that doctor's opinion the next day, it was almost like as a seven-year-old a doctor's opinion is finite oh yeah i'm fine and bang i got on with my life again and it, i thought it was just a you know maybe a little blip in mm. the, uh, we all have um, but then the first real sort of harrowing experience was when i was about 13 I, um in year eight in high school and uh i think that's a difficult time anyway when you're going through massive hormonal change yeah. and um yeah, it that was the uh, there was a catalyst there for p- puro uh, or I know that's not the the like the correct term, but uh, it's easier to everyone knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. I hope anyway uh, when I say puro. So um, that really developed in my second year of high school, and it was overwhelming. You know, it was it was a terrifying experience. Um, mm-hmm. that's not putting it lightly. Um, I think, uh, I think I'd, I'd watched an episode of Frost, um, in the evening, which I don't know why my parents allowed me to stay up for that, but, um, it's basically an episode where, um, he's, um, asked, speaking to a doctor who's saying that this guy who's committed this crime, he's a, a pedophile, basically. Mm. He's describing how he can't control that. He's just the way he is. And then just a simple thought popped in my head, like, oh my God, what if I, you know, what if I could be like that? And it terrified me so much um, that, uh, yeah, that was a real 
that was a very difficult time um, where also being actually raised as a Roman Catholic by my family, um, we say at the start of mass, I have sinned in my thoughts. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm, well, my girlfriend would say I take things very literally, uh, which I, I, I have to agree with now. Um, and I know that I took that very literally at the time. And um, I have sinned in my thoughts. So just having an intrusive thought meant, you know, I'm an evil person. I'm a monster. Mm. Sort of thing. Um, and that was the start of really trying to control my thoughts. And if I had a bad one, I'd have to go and confess it. This idea of confessing, um, which I used to do to my mum quite a lot. I was very, very lucky in that way and that my mum just... Um, really helped me through it so much at that age um she was very open talking to me about it we, i used to do this this thing i get i know it was a compulsion now but i used to write it down on paper if i had an intrusive thought i could write it down and i could leave it in in my mum's bedroom and then i didn't have to face her face to face to to uh, experience that shame that came with it so that eventually actually got really got me out of it in some ways because it was like i started to be able to see things a bit more objectively mm. yeah um by writing it down it wasn't it stuck in my brain and um and so yeah that 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 was a really horrible period but i did get through it um and i thought i'd beaten it i was about 16 i thought oh i've, I've beaten it it was a hormonal phase that's all it was um and then as i got into sixth form it suddenly as OCD loves to do it just um, completely evolved into something else um, which was I, I it sounds ridiculous now but I had this terrible um, obsession with worrying about going bald for years and, mm. and year, three or four years um, that was centered on um, you know if I find one hair that's like maybe a bit finer than the others is that the start of it and i think that uh, yeah really played uh, yeah really um had a, a different it was a really difficult time because i was trying obviously i was in i was in sixth form when this started um i still didn't know it was ocd i you know i i, I thought this was just something else that I, I had no idea what it was um but that was that that was really that was really difficult. I'm trying to think now. What I think because you're going you're going through all your A levels and your exams and mm. all that pressure. I wanted to get into drama school so badly, um, and at that age you're very impressionable. You can you know you, it's the first time you're not wearing uniform. People are trying to express themselves a bit more and feeling where you fit in. And that was it's uh, like I said, it sounds quite. I don't know. I look back at it and think it doesn't sound like anything that should be. And I think that's it, isn't it? With lots of OC types, they, they sound on the surface very innocuous, like that shouldn't, you know, everyone experiences this, that, the other. But the amount of time and mm. the amount of stress um, that it, it took up and it caused um, was, yeah, was really upsetting. Um, uh, but I, I, I managed to get into drama school. I managed to go. I went to Royal Welsh College, which I was really proud of. Um, and uh, that was a, a turbulent couple of years because I was dealing with that. I remember on the first night of um, Freshers, I was just uh, sitting down in front of the mirror in my halls of residence, just bawling my eyes out because mm. I'd spent about three hours looking at the back of my head and I hadn't gone out and you know, experienced, um, you know, what every fresher should be doing, you know, and getting to make new friends. And and um, and I spent a long time, the first two years of drama school, you're trying to play a character, play these different characters, but you're also trying to be normal mm. um, as well. And it was like, it was it was just too much at times. Uh, I remember because you you're standing in front of your peers doing a scene, which is quite vulnerable anyway. It's quite a vulnerable experience. It can be because at that point people are you know criticising and and um, 
I think trying at the same time not to have a bad thought, a bad thought, I just said that, about, um, about my hair was like, that is going to throw me right off here and I'm just going to uh, break down in front of these people. So that was difficult, but eventually I, I did settle. I did settle and um, I, I, again, did some really uh, good work with that. I got used to the idea. I think I got to about 21 and it just faded because I was like, oh, if I go ball at 21, loads of my mates are, it's not a big deal. Mm. I don't know why I put that age in my I did and uh, that minute 21 it means I'm okay um but uh I also experienced a very turbulent relationship in college um which was um yeah very very turbulent distressing and that that was over and I thought that's done I thought right I'm I'm doing really well now with my acting. I managed to get an agent. I was really excited about going out into the world and, you know, starting my career. And I knew I'd had all these various experiences that I've, ex I've um, explained to you um, so far, but it was, it was two years out of, two years out of drama school when I got this new relationship and it was, like my whole world turned upside down this was in 2012 and this was post-traumatic stress from the previous relationship now in spirit in this one and it was the the birth of you know what i now know it's well named you know sort of relationship ocd mm. which um is for, for me has been the most difficult subtype to navigate my way through i think because it it impacts on somebody else directly and that response of, you know, I know a lot of people, those have this inflated responsibility as well. Mm. The fact that it's, you know, it's okay if it's just harming me, but if it's harming somebody else as well, then it's really um, difficult. And it, it you know, you, I think self-esteem takes an absolute battering. Yeah. You know? um, I really, really found that difficult, um, you know, uh, it, it gets to the point where I can't even, I, I, well, it used to get to the point where I couldn't even look at another woman without thinking, oh my God, did I, did I look at her in a flirtatious way? And, you know, everything comes under the microscope. Um, what was that smart? I smiled at her. Oh God, does that mean I like, you know, and have I now been unfaithful? Have I, have I, you know, that, that means I've cheated. That's paramount to cheat it. Mm. And, um, that was that was a really difficult time um yeah that was a really difficult time that's probably the worst period because i think also being an actor i was i was in a tour of um a midsummer night's dream which is really like i was playing one of the lovers one of the big romantic oh, wow. characters yeah. who has to tell you know helena how much he, he he's fallen in love with her at the end and kiss her and um i got my you know, my then girlfriend was in the audience, and I remember the the uh, real um, mm. anguish. It was not enjoyable. You know, it was a, a horrible experience every night going on, trying to perform a myriad of compulsions just to get me through the scene, mm. so that I didn't do anything that I could deem unfaithful, um, and I could just get off. And it was in front of like hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. I, so really stressful that was, that was, um, and it it gets to the point where you just like, right, well, I just don't want to be an actor anymore. Or you mm. try and try and find excuses why you shouldn't be an actor. Oh, you know, it's not. It's, uh, well, actually, there's so many things you yeah. can say why you shouldn't be an actor, but um, uh, you know, it, it's not a you know a stable living or whatever. So you start like convincing yourself mm. that um, it, you know, it's not compulsions. It's Oh, I think it's someone that said so acting out of fear uh, disguised as practicality or something. Yeah. So that's, that's what was happening then. Mm -hmm. During that time, that's when I first sought help. That's when I first went to, uh, went to Mind Charity, um, which was helpful at the time. Um, but I think I found, I think I found over the years that, that after trying probably a million different counselors, it feels like obviously mm -hmm. not, but it feels like that, um, that 
unless it's specific specialist OCD therapy, so many of them have just been huge compulsions. Like I've gone, oh my God, I've actually just gone to this person um, and we've just focused on the cognitive part here and nothing else of the CBT or, or what they're saying they do. And it's more asking questions like why if, why do you have these thoughts? Well, that's not even important. Um, but that that was uh, so mm. that that's taken a long time trying to get that. Um, and um, sorry, I think I've completely diverted. <laughs> um, so good. So gone off road here. Um, in what I meant to say then was that after that mind therapy, I I decided to move to London. Um, me and my girlfriend had broke up then and I was ready to go to London um, and I, I'd i been dying to do this for so long, especially with the acting. I knew it's, it's the epicenter of where where it's all at and, mm. um, and that was a really exciting new chapter. I thought, okay, I've got through this period. I fit, my anxiety's gone down. I've been to mind. I'm ready to go to London. Um, and at the time I put down the breakup with my then girlfriend to be, Oh, um, it's just that we weren't meant to be together. It's not, it's not relationship OCD. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, that's the three years of stress, but you know, it's fine. Um, but then in 2016, I met my current partner. Um, and again, it was another explosion of ROCD again. And that's when it was like, oh, okay, this is this happens every single time you, you you meet someone now this is a running trait so perhaps i i'm starting to think that this is a, an actual problem that i and maybe this counseling isn't right maybe i need to find something a bit more uh, specialist um i i recall one day when i was in i think we were in westfield shopping center together and I just uh, I just ended up on the floor um, because the anxiety had become so overwhelming. Um, I couldn't. It, it was almost like, you know, when it's it's almost like every possible thing you're looking at is a trigger. Mm. Every possible like movement I make is a trigger. There is so many triggers were happening that you just I just I think just I I would say I broke down. Um, and uh yeah it was a really difficult time that and um a difficult time of course for my partner as well um seeing where that gets to there was a day when i punched the wall and my knuckles all it was all mm. just bleeding and i was very um distraught and you just feel like you're losing control and I mean, I mean, my self hatred was was really high at that point. I remember one day standing in front of the mirror and just I wrote down every single thing from head to toe what I hated about myself, oh. and I would cry myself to sleep. I couldn't even well, and it would take ages. It just take ages to do anything at that time. You know, it take ages just to just to get dressed. Getting dressed can take half an hour, forty five minutes, just because the simple act of standing up because that might give me some sort of sensation um, would trigger off so much anxiety that I'd have to sit down and stand up again. And that would take, a, you know, a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I found a little bit of, so, um, well, I guess, um, I guess help really with this. There was this. Um, my friend uh, Laura Darrell um, set up this company called uh, Hashtag It Affects Me. When people used to put those post its hmm. on their heads. I'm not sure if you saw it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, and um, she, she's a, she's an actor as well, and she she and because she knows one of my friends managed to get to meet her, and we talked. Um, she very kindly gave up her time, and we just spent an afternoon one day talking through some issues and she uh, asked me to write a blog for them which I did and it was one of the most cathartic experiences I've ever had but it also I couldn't believe the amount of people that 
wrote back saying they found similar things or and that that was the birth there of some sort of like uh, i guess like advocacy and wanting to talk about it more make it more of a a, a conversation that people don't need to feel um so much shame for um because i think that that's the big that's a big tox um that's the big poison sorry i think for mm. me was is shame um and so i'm very thankful to for doing that and she um she has then since then introduced me to efficacy which is the cbt therapy which i now do um i'm coming towards the end of it i got told i've got two more sessions so mm. after about 10 months now um and they have been fantastic um okay. they have i i've i tried so many obviously counselors and everyone's up until efficacy um but that when I, I first went there, I guess I was going there kind of thinking this isn't going to help again. Um, I've recovered before mm. and always ended up back where I am. Um, and I, but I, <clears throat> I remember having a conversation with my mum in the summer just as I started it. And I just said, you know, I think this is, this is, it's, it, it's a matter of life or death and it's not put, that's not putting it, um, that's not making it heavy at all. Mm. That's, really was because it got to a point where you're just thinking i'm not living here anymore so i would rather kill myself because mm. i just cannot face even going out the front door anymore i've said no to all my dreams and aspirations i've been so reclusive i haven't you know all my friendships my contacts my you know the groups that um inspire me they, they've all that's all gone the life's gone very very small mm. and i'm just existing here um so i knew it was a, 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 a real life life or death kind of thing and and um i i did the, that oci you know the the oc index okay yeah that test with efficacy at the start and i think they said if you score a 40 i think it was that's uh, correct me if i'm wrong actually that's supposed to be a significant yeah, you have significant OCD mm -hmm. or something. Um, <clears throat> I know I'd scored over 80, so I was very yeah. severe at the time. I just think, oh my God, I don't know, I don't know how I managed to even get to the to the counselor's door, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but she has been amazing, the therapist. Um, her name's Shireen, and she's she's um, we've. This has been the first time I've ever done exposure response prevention. And that has just been an absolute game changer for, for me. Hmm. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. But, um, it's not easy, but it's uh, the results are quite amazing, um, and it's really enabled me to start getting my life back. It's it's tough, but I, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to do it. But hmm. uh, uh, you know, we 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 built a like a, a hierarchy of fears um which and, and you know we sort of just in gradual exposure to those as, as we've gone up i think to throw me in at the deep end with exposure number 10 i probably would have panicked and and, and quit the therapy but mm. um starting small um for me a lot of it would go about relationships so watching um uh, a rom-com or something watching you know some of these films that uh, inspired this sort of hollywood idea of what love is and they lived happily ever after etc you know things that can trigger that um i probably started with um and then it would come to things like you know just actively smile at that woman that you pass on the street it doesn't mean anything you don't have to beat yourself up you don't have to analyze it i mean the rumination I mean that's that that is one of the the things that the replaying events when I found out yeah. that was a really really bad thing to do and it's so addictive because I came so good at doing it because mm -hmm. I built those neural pathways to you know fire um you know instantly um so yeah I think I think it was I guess it's essentially um challenging what you almost you you've become 
so good at doing subconsciously and your instinct and a lot of it goes against your instincts yeah um, and that's um and that's really interesting as well because i think <clears throat> being an actor i am um, i always got told to follow my instincts mm. and ocd says uh, <laughs> don't follow those instincts so it's that's kind of uh, yeah that's quite interesting um yeah um i'm not trying i'm trying to think i haven't seen explained clearly here where i i first experienced i first realized i had ocd sorry in um uh about eight years ago but i've i've had it for nearly 20 years hmm. so it's a bit mad that it takes it's taken that long yeah to realize that um yeah and get the right treatment and get the right treatment yeah so mm. it took 12 12 years to realize i had ocd and then it's taken seven years after that to get the right treatment so yeah 19 years yeah it's um takes a big part of your life yeah <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Well, I've I got a few questions. If you don't want me jumping yeah. in. Um, yeah, of course, that, yeah. Firstly, that thank you for going into so much detail and being so open. I, I appreciate it. Um, oh, no. Cool, man. Um, so, uh, first question really was, um, what, uh, have you, do your family know? And, and if so, mm. kind of when did they sort of find out? Uh, so... Uh, like I explained earlier, so my mum does, she's known uh, since I was 13 mm. that there's been something there um, and she's followed me through it. She's been probably the closest person um, in terms of always being so available to listen, um, which I'm very thankful for. And then I, I, think, my, I think my dad's got on board with it a bit later um that i mean he's been amazing and he's and he's just a very logical person so um and also i think when you're younger trying to speak to your dad about vulnerable stuff things that are going through your mind it's not really a comfortable <laughs> subject um so i think it's taken longer with with my dad to yeah just to get to try and explain it but now he's become almost um an expert himself he'll he'll sometimes speak to like phone me up and say i had this thought about this and i realized that's what you you must think with and i said oh yeah so he's got really into it now which is which is great mm -hmm. um, and then my brother and sister have only really i think found out very recently um i think as i become well, so, so much just got it so much more under control and and not feeling any more ashamed of saying you know talking openly about it so i think i'd be very open with them um but uh yeah yeah they're, they're very supportive like the most supportive that's that that's one of the things as well i think i've i've been so lucky to have such a supportive family mm live in such a I brought up in you can be brought up in a nicer place than than Rabina and all the Rabina rights love that um in Cardiff um and my life is was like like full of opportunity and full of like the, you know um so that's a never you know my lifestyle has been very uh comfortable as a child but then it's just it just took this one thought to pop in my head and it blew up. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that's another thing that you do beat. Or I used to beat myself up about was that idea of that there's people in third world countries, there's people you know, who have real problems. Your problem's not real. It's just mm. in your head, sort yourself out. You you know you're a disgrace. You know it, that's the kind of yeah. Um, yeah, it's which, a tough one. Yeah, but you know, no, they've been wonderful, really. Good, wonderful. good. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> no, thanks for that, and I appreciate you sharing that last bit. Um, yeah, I think many people, in, including myself, uh, can sometimes mm -hmm. feel almost guilty about even being in therapy and being like, people have it way worse than me. What am I sort of complaining about? Um, yeah. that, that was definitely my experience. It took a long time <laughs> to be able to feel worthy. You know that, whether regardless of how much I suffered or didn't, 
<clears throat> if I suffered a bit, that deserves treatment, love, compassion, all that good stuff. Um, so uh, y- you mentioned about the blog post and you said it was very yeah. cathartic, kind of writing it out. Uh, and you said about um, it potentially got rid of some shame. Um, yeah. What was it about writing out your experience that kind of removed some of that shame? Um, I think I've, I've always had to write it down. Um, I've gone through so many notebooks, so many. I always carry one with me everywhere I go and write down because it's too much of a jumble up in my head and it's too confused with emotion and all the rest of it. So I think, first of all, it's very objective. Mm. I write it down on the paper and I can see it. And it's like, oh, I can see where this fits now and where, you know, see the patterns and it makes more sense to me. Um, I think I had to get off my chest at that time. Um, I don't know at the time if it was maybe a little bit of a cry for help. But I, I wanted to, and it's something that I really, really feel like I, I, I'm passionate about, is, is, is helping other people. It's, I realize that's my whole mantra, if you like, if with, with acting. The whole reason I fell into acting, I actually decided I wanted to be an actor during my first bout of OCD, you know, and I, because I, I realized watching other people going through something um, trying to figure something out, showing that you're not alone, that other people feel the same and go through similar experiences is a really um, collective experience to share something, just to take the armor off and say, you know, I have these intrusive thoughts, you know, um, you know, and, and I, I do too. I feel um, I, I hate my body, I, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and just sharing, sharing that and, and helping others is something that I, 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 that was the really cathartic thing is that it, 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 it engaged with other people who relate and they related with it and they came back with theirs and it just, I just didn't feel alone for the first, I felt so, so alone when I wrote that. Mm. I, <clears throat> I was living on my own in London and I was, I, it was the first time I'd gone through depression as well. And I've, I've never experienced depression apart. Like, obviously, I, I've experienced a lot of low mood and, mm. you know, with, with that, will, that would come from OCD and anxiety. But it was the first time I'd, I'd experienced real depression. And it, all I can say is that it felt like a, this dark, inky... I, it, was, it was almost very physical. I could mm. almost see this very dark, inky blackness coming over me. And um, it, that was very difficult to lift myself out of that. That would have been around the time, like I explained to you, I was looking in the mirror and listing all the things I hate about myself. Um, so knowing that there was somebody else out there, even if even if only one person got back to me and said that, I would have made such a difference because I think for me it's been shame and loneliness are like the two two of the worst ingredients for that you can have mm. um that that allow the all this negativity to fester yeah yeah no thank you for, for describing in so much detail um mm. oh no so um what's the word visually like it really so, sort of made me yeah. see it um yeah no thanks for that um i'm always intrigued when i hear people say you know something was cathartic so thank you for explaining uh so with uh efficacy and the cbt you've done with them and and then the erp when you first Mm -hmm. sat down and the therapist kind of started talking about erp and um and how you guys were going to do it together i guess what was coming up for you what was it like uh were, were you fearful were you ready were you you know anything um yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I was definitely fearful, especially mm. when initially, obviously, once you first mentioned ERP, the first thing I do is go and Google ERP, yeah. you know, so you find out all these horror stories. Too, and I was like, no, no, sorry, stay off that. So I didn't, didn't go down that route. But um, yeah, it is. 
I definitely felt fear because it was the first time I was being told I've got to to face my fears. Mm. Um, and it's going to take an incredible amount of courage to face these fears and sit with it. Um, so some of those <clears throat> some of those things might have been looking at a picture of someone or an image of something that might really really set me off, and I might have to. I'd usually perform a compulsion before I knew it, and I got rid of it or chucked it away. But I I had to look at it for <clears throat> I think there it was an hour towards mm -hmm. the end. It was like, can you sit and look at this picture for an hour? And noticing that anxiety spike, but, you know, hitting that top of the curve. And then it eventually it starts to fade and fade and fade. And, and then the next day you do it and it spikes, but it doesn't spike as high. And it, the curve, some days it might, some days it might go higher. But the, I think the fact that I kept seeing that um, I was able to sit with the anxiety, it was a horrible feeling. But that's all it is. It's a horrible feeling. Mm. Feelings aren't important. And I think that was some, that's was that been something that's really helped me, is knowing that at the end of your feelings is nothing, but at the end of your principle, at the end of every, at the end of every principle is a promise. Mm. That's, what I, I, that's a quote of uh, Ed Thomas, I think. Oh, Eric uh, Thomas, yeah. Eric Thomas, yeah. E.T. E.T., yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've list, yeah, listened to a lot of his stuff, and it really... Um, yeah, that, that really helps that line, actually, that mm. particular line. Um, so what else did you say there on that? No, it was just really your first, it was really good, but your first experiences of kind of being in, uh, well, when the therapist was discussing ERP with you and maybe yeah. developing the hierarchy. Yeah, and developing that hierarchy was um, was just just really helpful again just to work it so just to see something written down it's almost like oh, i can see this mountain now that i'm going to climb yeah i'm going to start at start at the bottom i'm not going to think it's like going out for a run um i love running i'm addicted i got addicted to running that really helped me get through this mm. um you know if you think at the start of the run oh my god i'm going to do 10k 10k is bloody miles you know whatever you know i'm not going to get you start thinking about the bigger thing you're not going to get there but if you think i'm just gonna think about one step at a time mm. and i'm just gonna enjoy this this one step one step one step and eventually you've done 5k and you're like oh i'm feeling good and i can do it. i've got my endorphin rush coming now as well mm. i can go do a bit more um so yeah i think i think yeah working that through was was great she was brilliant as well because it was the first therapy where she was actually actively using like the whiteboard and we were writing things down and she'd get me to write things down it was very it's been very practical based yeah 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 much more sort of engaging or hands-on mm -hmm. um yeah no, that that's great and what were your so when you you did the hierarchy um and you sort of listed it out and you you sort of ranked it in terms of how scary it is uh, or how anxiety provoking when yeah. you when you first did that and you saw whatever your like 10 out of 10 was yeah was there part of you well, i guess what were your thoughts of that 10 out of 10 at that point like the idea of facing that that thing at that time at that time the idea of facing that sort of as you said that 10 out of 10 um was frightening Hmm. Um, there, there's no two ways about that. I think, certainly for, speaking from my own experiences, it is a, it is frightening to face it. Um, but I was also really, really determined um, to to beat this. And I know I've tried everything else, and nothing else has worked. So, and this was so different doing this that I just and and like I said, I got to a point and fortunately I think it is for a lot of people that I seem to, and then people that I've heard on your podcast as well, you know, when they say it's only when they seem to get to like, I was thinking of killing myself that I'm, I actually felt determined enough to, to beat this. And that's, that's, that's crazy. Mm. That shouldn't be the case. Um, but that's the case it had got to. So I was just so determined to, to, I, I like I said to my mum in the summer, you know, I need to save my my life, mm. so I I did see it as that, and I've really stuck to it. Um, I really stuck to it. Any anything that I find that's I'm I might be avoiding this now because of my fear, I just go and do it. Yeah, yeah. It's almost become a new addiction, mm. and 
that event that is, at first is quite hard work because you're going against your intuition but eventually it does become second nature yeah you're almost leaning into it now as Lean- and when it rises yeah absolutely and really engaging in the present moment that's been something that i've really okay. I'm refocusing on that and i think actually this time now with coronavirus and not knowing that the future is so uncertain being able to just come straight back to the present moment at the moment has really been helping actually with with what's going on now as well mm. um yeah not getting sort of overwhelmed by you know i think i think there's i think our relationship with time is such a key thing as well with <clears throat> anxiety yeah Mm. Um, yeah good point um yeah just taking one day at a time one day at a time yeah the um i've got it's my favorite um my favorite one of my favorite quotes that william blake's um to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour Mm. i just love those four lines they just make me feel so peaceful and the other day, all I did was sit in the garden for about two hours, like in the middle of the garden, just watch like, oh, there's a bumblebee, you know, there's a, a bird. And it was so relaxing, very meditative. And that really helps that for, yeah. for me, focusing on the present like that. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. And um, would you say that the therapy you've done recently has helped you kind of get to that place? Yeah, yeah, without a, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, there's... Mm. I think maybe when I was about six, seven sessions in, I had a feeling that was like, I wonder if this is going to be it and it's too good to be true. And But I've done, I've, I've had a quite a lot. I've had nearly 20 sessions now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been so much to unpack, but it, it's, it's just been, um, yeah, it's just been, it's been life, life changing really. And every single, every single session I've had is I've had a kind of wow moment. Not to say that that that's what you should have because it's different for everyone. But there's some there's maybe, maybe if not a wow moment, there's always a moment where you're always like, God, that is so interesting. Mm. That really changes the way I, I think about this or that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, which is mm. kind of what was a sort of a big epiphany moment for you in your recovery. Or like in the way you've just described it, kind of a light bulb moment. Just any, any ones that stick out for you of, okay, I get it now, or, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I would say something that is, I, I might have said it already, but I think certainly to um, light bulb kind of moments, uh, for me have been those moments when, I've realized I need to go against my intuition here. Um, and I, I tr- trying to think of a key example for you. Um, but it's almost like when, like I said, when, when I'm going running, for example, I noticed um, during the therapy when I've been running, I was thinking, oh my God, every single part of my intuition here is telling me to stop running. I'm in so much pain. Uh, I can barely breathe um, and um, this is really boring <laughs> you know and all these negative thoughts and feelings mm. were telling me to, to, to stop but um, I did not I it's it's being able to override that and just be like no I am gonna keep running I'm gonna keep running keep, throw as many negative thoughts as you want at me throw as many of uh, you know uh, horrible feelings and sensations i'm going to get to the end of this i'm going to get to the finish line and i'm going to feel great because of it um and in fact i might get to the finish line and think no i'm going to run all the way back now as well and um realizing that action is taking positive action uh can override all these thoughts and feelings that that that, uh, that i place so much importance on so i think i think i guess i i think somewhere between the running and the therapy i kind of realized that mm. um that's uh yeah that i i call it actions not over feelings mm. is what i call it for me uh because i've always been a feelings first then take action and now i'm like no don't 
just turn that light off if you want to turn it off. Don't you don't have to have a, um, a what I would call a positive, pure thought as I turn the light bulb off. You don't you know that just that doesn't make any sense. Just turn it off, and whatever thought and feeling happens, it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Mm. Um, and I, I I think that that was a, that's a big thing that realizing that yeah thoughts and feelings don't mean anything. It's mm. what action you decide to take, um, how you choose to behave. You know, we all have. I think that was very interesting. On the, one of the first, no, it was my very first session. She gave, um, Shireen gave me this list of um, a survey of people who'd had intrusive thoughts, what kind of intrusive thoughts, how frequent, and it was, it was, um, it was. If somebody looked at that from the outside, they might think it was crazy, but um, it just showed me that everyone has these. The intrusive thoughts aren't the problem. It's how I'm reacting to them. It's how how much importance I'm giving them. They're not important. What I decide to do is important. And hmm. that's been that's been huge. I think that's been difficult with I think that's been difficult with being um as well having this sort of dramatic background with, in acting in that you are taught to follow your feelings. You're taught to really focus on your feelings a lot. Um hmm. and emotion. Um but doesn't work for me in real in real life you know yeah, yeah. sensitivity to it <clears throat> yeah no i like that thank you for, thank mm. you for sharing um and a similar question then but uh kind of the flip side which is what was a, a, a sort of a big roadblock for you in your recovery journey and how did you overcome it a big roadblock um mm. hmm roadblock i think a huge roadblock for me was when i i had the little period where i i felt like after going to this this counselor in the nhs i felt like i'd beaten the ocd and for about a year i was okay and i thought i'd made some real headway things are only going to get better now they're not going to get worse and I just, I don't even know how it started. It was just very like osmosis kind of effect. Eventually, out of nowhere, I realized I was back at square number one. Well, actually, it felt like I was at square like minus 10. And that was really, really uh, disheartening at the time when you feel like you've recovered and you suddenly find yourself, oh, I'm, fuck, I'm struggling with the same issues again. And I'm never going to be better. That's what it felt like. Again, I'm saying like feelings aren't important because that's just what it felt like. Um, but it's just not the case. Uh, and I would say to anyone who's who may struggle with that or may have felt like they've recovered but they've relapsed or or whatever, you you, you will all, you can always get better again. Um, I think some I think someone said something like. Um, in the end, it'll all be okay. Hmm. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. Yeah. And I really like that. Um, yeah. It'll always be fine. It's like, I think I've become very content with feeling like, just in life in general, but also like, I'll go out today, I'll leave the house, and I know some things are bad are going to happen. But if I, f but, you know, it'll all be okay. I, you know, I know it can sound quite cliche, a bit cheesy, but it, it's, that it really is the case. Like you go for a run. I think I know I'm going to feel a lot of pain. I know it's going to be a struggle. I know I'm not going to, I'm going to have a lot of negativity, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then that became the thing with ERP then was like, this is going to be a horrible experience. Um, is what it felt like before I started. It might, this might be a horrible experience. I'm, I might feel scared and frightened i might feel um my anxiety rising you know all these horrible physical sensations but i'm going to get i'm going to commit to this hour and there's no way i'm going to form a compulsion no way um and that that suddenly makes you start to feel really strong yeah. i've said to myself i'm not going to do that and i did it. and i yeah so i that 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 became that then becomes oddly quite addictive then 
what what else can I what what, what other stuff can you throw at me? Um, yeah, it almost yeah. almost turned it into kind of a game then. Yeah, yeah, very much yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. And um, <clears throat> you know, words just words of hope for anyone experiencing OCD. Um, I I would say I would say it like that it it will all be okay in the end and I think I I know I've been to many places myself and so many other people out there have of like really at the bottom um, of feeling like I just would rather just end it because I because I can't see any other way but just making taking positive action so not thinking necessarily positively it's very difficult to think positively when you're thinking negatively already mm. very difficult to do that but just to do something positive instead so celebrate all those achievements that you make like one day i felt so depressed felt like i you know felt terrible but i managed to get up i made my bed i uh, got dressed um and I, th- I think I watched TV and I, I celebrated that. And, you know, I really celebrated little achievements like that. It took me so much willpower just to get out of bed some days. And you should celebrate those, celebrate those little achievements because when you start doing that as well, they start to build up as well. It starts, like you said, like a, a positive game. Um, uh, I hope that can help in some way. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think and, and being your own best friend um you know we we're taught to feel shame we're taught to constantly look at our negative stuff right from the start of primary school we're taught you know don't be naughty don't um say a rude word don't do this and we're constantly so sort of, I think taught to almost scrutinize ourselves so much instead of actually being our own best friends and I think you should you've got to talk to yourself how you would talk to a loved one, you know, like some of the things I said to myself um, when I was really struggling, I, I can't believe that's what a bully would say, you know, that's really, really vindictive. Don't say that to yourself. Yeah. Um, so be, be your own best friend and, and um, celebrate every, every little achievement, no matter how insignificant. And I think I, uh, yeah. And just take, take your time, be patient with it. Mm really be patient don't start worrying so much about the future and you've got to focus on the present um and that's hard to do hmm. that, that is hard to focus on the present we're not taught to do that either we're taught oh when i go to high school i get this grade then i go yeah. here i go here until you've got a degree and then you, you kind of go oh i don't know what to do now so yeah so i think that as well yeah committing to the present being kind kind to yourself yeah hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I love all of that. Um, yeah, be kind to yourself. Uh, okay, so you can pick up the phone and call the 20-year-old Sam. What would you tell him? <laughs> uh, the 20-year-old Sam. I would first of all tell him to be himself and stop trying to be James Dean or someone. Um, just really embrace the Samness of Sam mm. as a uh, I, I I think being um, happy with being yourself, certainly at 20, is very important. Um, I think I think when you are being yourself and you are being true to yourself anyway, I, I, I feel like um, so many other things become irrelevant that I was worrying about because I desperately wanted to fit in or, you know... Um, or whatever it is and 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 I would say I would say really really if there's something that you love doing then really really stick with it like even if you get told you know like I said that many times with the acting I've thought I I just don't want to do this I try to find reasons not to do it because it's been difficult at times but uh, or you know particularly stressful at times but if you love doing it you've got to keep doing it because that's been another thing that's really got me through th- this period now is that focusing on the present it's almost like I say to myself every day focus on the present that means fighting the OCD bully which is if you like 
that bully in the playground who says, give me 10p. Uh, but if I give him 10p, which is a compulsion, tomorrow, what's he going to do? He's going to ask for 20p. Yeah. So it, don't give him 5p either, because that's still <laughs> still slightly, slightly doing a compulsion there. So you don't give him anything. He might give he might hit me in the face for doing that, but it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be tough, but he he isn't gonna come back tomorrow, mm-hmm. and and I I think that's that's been really um, really uh, a helpful visual thing for me is fight the OCD bully, and and keep doing what you love doing because it's something I can really focus on. Yeah. I can focus on the present on that. If someone puts a play in front of me, I'm going to read it and enjoy it. And mm. I can commit to the present with it. Um, so I'd say, yeah, really stick, stick with what you love doing and, and don't, you know, you've been given these talents or whatever it is. You've, you know, everyone's got it. Everyone's got this, um, something to, to shine. We're all, we're all meant to do that, mm. but we all, get a bit scared of um, wanting to show off our talent, I think. I think mm-hmm. everyone does. It's like everyone's got it, but everyone gets told, don't get too big for your boots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you do it, then everyone else feels encouraged to do it. So it's a good, it's a, it, yeah, so I would say keep following your, your, and I also change that. I can't say keep following your dream because I realized when I was saying dream, I was so focused on just one thing and that still might be out of my control one, you know, so I changed it to follow my heart. Mm. Whatever my heart tells me like, this is what I love to do. Then I, then I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Good distinction. Um, and then you've got a a billboard in Cardiff. (laughs) What what do you want written on that billboard? Um, Oh, what's a kid in? Um, what do they have on that? Um, I think what I it, it, it actually have already said, but it would be to um, be your own best friend and, and celebrate every achievement, no matter how insignificant it may seem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, is there anything else that you wish you could have said today? Um, so, oh, so, yeah, probably so much. Um <laughs> Yeah, there's there's helpful texts. I've got them with me. These are yeah. this, this one, which you all know. The, oh, do you want to oh, read them out? Yeah. Overcoming obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, David Veal and Rob Wilson. That I got told to get this out when I started. My mm-hmm. therapist told me to get this out as something to to look at as well, like side by side. Um, and this book for me, for anyone with pure the Rose Bridgette, oh, yeah. pure that i mean she does not hold back in no. talking about the the truth of it all and 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 it's funny as well and it's not it's not just like a, a depressing read it's it's a memoir and it's yeah. actually really well written um so that's been great and also also uh, anyone i think you feels um maybe i felt a lot of shame about i'm on i take medication mm. as well uh take fluoxetine now and that has been a real Chain, big, it's made a big difference to me so yeah. I think if anyone's feeling a bit nervous or, or, or maybe even shameful for taking or relying on medication and there's no reason to and um, you know it's no different to someone with diabetes taking insulin it's yeah. just no different so you sh- I think um, yeah I'd like to get that out there that, that that's that's really worked well coinciding with the ERP as well I think. yeah yeah no important yeah thank you for for sharing that and being open um and look thank you so much just generally for this whole last hour sharing your story going into so much detail i really appreciate it oh thank you so much and it's been a real privilege getting to speak to you Stuart. and um you know if i've waffled anywhere i, I, I apologize but it's all um, good <laughs> uh, i'm new to all this skyping stuff i'm such a technophobe um but uh thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it there you have it thank you to sam for his time and to you guys for listening and don't forget today's episode is sponsored by nocd to find out more about nocd and their treatment plans head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the ocd stories or the link will be in the description of this episode 
And quick disclaimer guys, this podcast is not therapy, it is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.